Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. And today we are going to talk about the first two books of Brotherhood of the Griffin by Richard Lee Byers. First up, we have The Captive Flame. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you in advance that I'm going to get a lot of things mixed up here. Uh, and I'll get into why in just a second. First off, I just want to say very excitedly that, yay, after Unholy, I was really worried that I wasn't going to like this at all, and I was just going to be like, okay, done, skipping all the Brotherhood of the Griffin, which is like a third of friggin' fourth edition or some crap. But I really enjoyed The Captive Flame uh, way more than I thought I would. I felt Alth, uh became an interesting character again, I found out he was a Thean. <laughs> Somehow, I hadn't really caught on to that through the whole thing, even though it makes absolute sense and everything. The rest of the Brotherhood uh, burst into life here, I think, in a way that they absolutely didn't in Unholy. We have Jezri, the female mage with a lot of issues in her past that we only start to get a hint of in the first book. Uh, we have Gaydeen or something, uh, whose name I'm going to talk about a little bit more, but I've got a lot of different quotes, I think, and I'm going to hold off on talking about that until we get to that point. He's the kind of Han Solo-ish character of the group, and he has a thing for Jezri, but she's not in a place where she can accept that sort of thing, so they always have this kind of will-they-won't-they they hanging over their heads. It's a very moonlighting. I, of course, because... I don't know. I For some reason, Richard Lee Byers, I know he kind of says that his main influence is horror, and that's kind of like what he tries to infuse into the realms and everything, and I see that for certain, but I, for whatever reason, for me, his like romantic subplots are what I feast on the most. You know, the whole, I still think her name was Tamath, and I'm probably wrong, but the whole Tamath Barreras thing was what really interested me about the Haunted Lands trilogy, and here there's their chemistry along with something that doesn't really get fleshed out until book two, I don't believe, but Alf and uh, Sarah, who's a uh, priest of Am Am Amantar, Amanantar, something, I, I, I can't remember exactly how it's spelled, it's it's one of those things where like you see it and you you see it and you read it but saying it out loud you're like oh hell I if I don't have it in front of me I don't exact I don't know exactly what it is but in any case I really enjoy their relationship and the ups and downs uh, that are coming along with it in any case starting reading the captive flame I really like dug like hey that book felt like it was like a hundred pages long like it just flew right by, and I really thought, oh, this is awesome. He's just going to start uh, doing these self-contained uh, little, like, almost TV show bite-sized chunks of story, and I thought it worked really well. Then the book ends, and none of the plot threads have been resolved, and I was like, oh, okay, it's going to be two short books, uh, and, and we're going to get this, this plot resolved. But at the end of book two, we're still going with all these plot threads, and book two really feels like a hell of a lot of filler, so it was, I, I don't know how long this thing is going to go on. But let's try to focus as much as possible on book one, and maybe the best way to do that is to jump into some quotes. So my first thing that I bookmarked here, I think was more just out of my own personal confusion. He keeps referring to the war hero who's essentially the head of state of this place where they've been hired by somebody who's not exact, or I can't remember if they're originally hired by the war hero or someone else. The first book is a lot of setup and a lot of like political wrangling in this nation, uh, whose name is escaping me. Is it Jacenta? I want to say, I want to say it's Jacenta. It's where, yeah, Jacentans. Mages are looked upon as kind of scary and weird, but they're having uh, these murders uh, happen, the green hand murders, uh, mages have, they like have to get this green tattoo on their hand, basically their whole hand is made green so that everybody can know that they're a mage if they're living there, and suddenly people who are talking against the mages 
are being murdered and green handprints are being left at the crime scenes and the the people who hire Alf and his brotherhood feel like they can't trust anyone on the inside with this so they have to bring somebody in from the outside of course Alf and Jezri are both magic users which oh by the way I, was, I went through a roll call there and I totally forgot to mention Cor- Corin Karun uh, whose like last name is like Grimdark or Blade Dark or something ridiculous, but he's a dwarf on the team, and he kind of starts pairing up a lot with someone who's not on the team and whose name I'm totally blanking on in the moment, but he's a dragonborn paladin of Torm, uh, which is very interesting, and um, his sidekick, his like squire or whatever whose name I also can't remember. I want to say it's like Barisar or something like that, uh, who is probably my favorite character by far, and he kind of comes into his own in the second book. In here, they keep talking about the war hero, and for some reason, I swear, like, the entire first book, the war hero doesn't get a name. Uh, she gets a name come the second book, which is cool, because, yay. For other reasons, she isn't really, like... The war hero anymore like like she kind of retains that title but the title gets taken back by the original owner which doesn't make a lot of sense but I'll, I'll get into it when I talk about book two there's this thing that Byers does and many other authors do it as well but for some reason it really seems to stick out a lot to me when Byers does it and that is that especially in fight scenes, and I of course I, I kept a lookout for it and I couldn't find it in a fight scene anymore after I started looking for it and was like, I must mark this down the next time that I see it. But he has this habit of starting a new sentence with either then or suddenly then, and the immediacy is ruined more than if he would have just said what happened next. And the example that I found which is really kind of a weak one, is the shaman frozen position and a kind of discoloration ran through his flesh, staining it a different shade of gray. Then his outstretched arms crumbled under their own weight. So take the then out of that sentence. His outstretched arms crumbled under their own weight. And it's like, can you see how there's a bit more immediacy there to it and how it flows a little bit better? This is, I'm not even blaming buyers for this. This is just kind of uh, splotchy editing here. And I know it's nitpicky, but I swear it comes up a lot. Oh, and the one other note that I have in book one here is the fact that for some reason, Byers seems convinced and his editors are fine with this, that lightning bolt is a single word. The lightning bolt. <laughs> it's like, it's two words, dude. It's always two words. It doesn't just get to be its own word. That's weird. Not a lot worth pointing out here in book one. Book one really just is super breezy and fun. It felt super fast, super enjoyable. The characters really clicked for me, and I wanted to read more about them. I thought it was a little annoying that the plot didn't get wrapped up because I thought it would be, and it didn't seem like it was that intense of a plot. Then we get to book two, Whisper of Venom. Not Venom in Her Veins, which is a different Realms book, and uh, I was very confused by that for a little bit, and uh, not Spectral Blaze, which would seem to come right after the Captive Flame, right? It seems more thematically linked or whatever, but no, instead... We have Whisper of Venom, which maybe I've forgotten what Captive Flame meant, because I, I have this feeling that maybe that was actually used at some point. But Whisper of Venom, I have no idea what that means or why that makes any sense. So, you know, whatever. Here's the thing about book two. Book one ends with uh, the Brotherhood inadvertently, really, restoring this dragon to power in Chisenta, who everybody wants back, because everybody's like, oh, this dragon, you know, when when he ruled, everything was so great. It was all great in the old days, and blah, 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 blah. And so they rescue this dragon, and the dragon takes over again as ruler of Chisenta, and immediately everything starts going to hell. Like, he's... Uh, 
really self-centered and he seems determined to start a war with another country for no apparent reason and he's also somewhat in collusion with some other dragons on the sly and he randomly appoints this one chick to be his like prophetess even though she's just like a crazy woman and it's i, I mean i get that he's kind of doing a caligula thing and what have you but it it's not as interesting as uh, I, I mean like suddenly we're bogged down in all these politics and it just feels like dude why doesn't somebody just friggin kill him you know like i get that like cold blood and murder is tough and blah 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 blah, blah but it's like when it, the stakes are that high you know i mean like they nearly like lose a battle because he doesn't come out and fight when he's supposed to and yada 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 it just it doesn't uh i don't know it, it didn't track a lot for me like everybody just kind of trying to figure out ways to manage him instead of just taking him out because it's like dude this is just not getting better you know but um whatever my main issue with this book is that there is just so much fighting it is just fight scene after fight scene after fight scene and it feels really filler packed it it doesn't it seems as if you know like with the first one up until, I don't know, maybe the three quarters point, I still had faith that the end would come and we would see, like, oh, there'll be a cute little wrap up, there'll be one fun twist, done, we're out of Chisenta. And by like 20% in, there was just so much damn filler fighting that I was like, none of the plot threads are gonna get tied up even at the end of this book, are they? And of course they aren't, and we're still going at the same damn plot at the start of book three. And it's like, holy crap, there should not be this much <laughs> of this damn plot going on. The character, I like the squire, I guess, of the paladin here, has this really interesting character arc in this book. I really liked what happened with the dragonborn and kind of by extension the dwarf Curin as well. In this book... The squire goes undercover, essentially, because they start helping out these other dragonborn who follow Tiamat, but all of them are fighting ash giants. And of course, if you know anything about the dragonborn in 4E, they were slaves of dragons, and so it is kind of... Or no, sorry, they, they aren't followers of Tiamat, they're followers of Bahamut. But they are secretly being led by someone who's a follower of Tiamat, and so that sucks. But they, they think they're following Bahamut, because Bahamut is a good dragon. But the dragonborn in general were slaves of dragons, and so they, you know, uh, our main dragonborn characters, the paladin and his squire, are like, dude, like, you... Just following any dragon is yucky and weird and, you know, you're into some freaky shit there, right? So, uh, he goes undercover and pretends to become a follower of Bahamut in order to find out if there's anything more going on behind the scenes. And, of course, there is. They're being led by this uh, uh, female dragonborn who is, in fact, a follower of Tiamat and up to shenanigans... Because that's what those Tiamat followers do. Alf and uh, Jezri and Gaiden uh, mainly are dealing with the dragon dude. Corin's very much sidelined for most of this. He just kind of helps out the dragonborn and uh, not much else and thinks about like, well, I thought I'd go get to see my wife, but I guess not. That's really his whole part in this book, but maybe he will play a bigger role in the wrap-up. I will go ahead and say here, as I have probably said before <laughs> when talking about the Rage of Dragons and all that sort of stuff, man, I find dragons dull. I just don't find them interesting at all, and overall, in the Realms 4E especially, it feels like we're getting dragons jammed down our throat over and over and over again. They were used cleverly in the Godcatcher. I will give Godcatcher that, but it was still all around dragons. In here, we get these hints of Zor Zorvental, the kind of game of dragons, the, the game of houses that they play. And 
in Godcatcher, it seemed far more interesting and uh, kind of this game where you never really knew what the pieces were doing. And here, it seems like, A, it's meant to be this huge, huge mystery, and I get it that most humans wouldn't know about it or whatever, but B, it also seems like much more, much less subtle and uh, much stupider, and it's like... Well, which is it, I guess? You know, is it basically just dragons beating the crap out of each other and trying to take over places? Or is it this subtle game that's beyond human comprehension and blah, 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 blah. In any case, God, I am so sick of reading about dragons. And I get that it's Dungeons and Dragons, right? But it's like, come on, guys. There are other things. And I'm assuming buyers must just really like dragons because of he's written a lot of books about dragons. But yeah, I'm really tired of it really really tired of it let's go into some quotes there's just a mention here samister who'd created the undead worms and i was like oh did he i don't remember that but i remember he was kind of the big bad from rage of dragons this next one uh that i quoted here is just to point out something i i, I saw something throughout this book where I think Byers is really trying to stretch his writing ability and try to go from just a uh, uh, kind of paint-by-numbers standard realms writer to really trying to capture a little bit more of a literary feel. And maybe literary isn't the right word, but, but you know, he's, he's aspiring for greater heights because he's doing this thing that a lot of... Uh, this, this is a weighted word, but a lot of better writers do where he will stop a sentence and then begin the next one, but it's really a clause. But he's not very good at it. And so it just kind of drives me crazy. Like, here's a for instance. Jazar advanced on Marilane, period, who recoiled a step. And the sentence goes on from there. It's not that bad. But it's like, what did you gain by making that a period instead of a comma as it really should have been grammatically. It doesn't give it that sort of pause that you want it to have. It just makes me think, who the hell edited this? There's another example of the same thing. The ghosts ignored the combatants on the ground and soared up into the air, period. Where, insubstantial is the spirits of the wind, again, Editing, 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 editing. I get what he's going for, and sometimes it works, but most of the time, it's really friggin' annoying. Here's a specific example about Zorvental. But Zorvental changes things. Every dragon is studying every other for signs of weakness, and while one wins points for achievement and guile, a player can also score for daring and renown if he makes the right move. Can he? Didn't seem to be the case in earlier things that we read, but whatever. Okay, so I thought I had marked that section about uh, Gaiden's name, but I apparently didn't. So since I remember it, I'll go ahead and dive into that. Gaiden is... I, I, I looked that up because I was like, it's in my head every time I pronounce it, I think of Ninja Gaiden. Um, so I looked that up. And that means tale or uh, uh, diversionary story or something like that. So I was like, well, that doesn't really make any sense. But at one point, he makes a joke with Jezri that he's going to... I think I think he's going to roleplay for a uh, cover story when they're going undercover at one point. That he's going to pretend to be her knight, her squire, or whatever. And um, and he says, really, I am already. And I thought, wow, you know, another way to pronounce his name with the way that it's spelled would be Gaideen. Which, of course, harkens back to Wheel of Time. And if you haven't read that, Gaideen is another name for a warder who's essentially a woman's knight, without going into a lot of detail there. And I just thought, oh, you know, Byers used Malazan as a name of a dragon in another book, and I really wonder if this was another little minor tip of the hat through names. So I don't know, I, I'm going to assume yes, because I can do that. That's what assumptions are. In any case, I have now talked a lot about these books and not really said anything about the plot, and I apologize yeah, it's a lot of political wrangling, and it's a lot of, like, where the hell is this leading, and is this plot going to be 
friggin' six books books long because I don't want it to just keep being fighting, 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 fighting. I'm gonna keep reading because I'm now connected enough to most of the characters, even though I can't remember my favorites' names. But yeah, I'm. Um, I I hope that it gets somewhere. I hope that it gets to a point somewhere. And yeah, this was. Um, I really liked it a lot more as a book one than I do at book two. But overall, I'm still digging it at this point. Up next time. We're going to delve into more Richard Lee Byers because it's all taking place like that. He he is really good about giving the dates. And I mean, this is all just basically the next day, the next day, the next day, right? Uh, we're also going to delve into book two of The Chosen of Nendawan. Catch you then. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.